I'm Ellen Kleckner. I live in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. I serve as the executive director of the Iowa Ceramic Center and Glass Studio. Through a convergence of materials, I seek to understand connections, connections between place, material, legacy, makers, communities, and ideas. My work utilizes the visual and mechanical vocabulary of makers and craftspeople, both historic and contemporary. I bring the historical into the contemporary by creating something new that remains familiar yet comforting. The physicality of material is critical to my work. I join parts of all kinds together to create new and complete forms that provoke the question of utility within a recognizable object. Systems of joinery for me serve as a way to explore the binary between material and concept. I use and like combinations of media joined together, such as wood and basket reed, steel, and clay. These illustrate the connections between materials. In my piece, Form Juncture, I collaborated with metalsmith Mike Sneller to create a dovetail joint made of wood and steel that's over six feet tall. I carved the three-foot log and then worked with Mike to fit steel components that I created but utilized his expertise from. With the support of the Iowa Arts Council, I've been able to employ the material expertise of other contemporary craftsmen to help manifest concepts and my ideas on a larger scale. My rockers are a direct labor of personal intention to create a lasting voice. They speak of generosity, receptivity, as well as comfort. Once grounded, my rockers repeat their intention. I want them to comfort and contain through their movements. By creating these new forms, I am exploring the concepts of maternity, as well as the collective care that is required to create and nurture something new. In my piece, Junction One, Embrace, I join the familiar materials of basket reed and clay together to create a new enclosed form. In this piece, there is no adhesive, no glue. This allows the materials in the future to be separated without compromise with one another. This in itself is a key concept of my work, mutual reliance. Each of my pairings of materials find balance within a two-part system. The materials become interdependent while maintaining individual integrity. It's at this moment of balance that my visual narrative depicts the moment of mutual reliance that materials have on one another in order to create new and everlasting forms. I approach collaboration with the same concepts that are seen in the physicality of my work a mutual alliance of independent makers that come together to create something new. I employ exploration and play paired with traditional craft practices to create with the collaboration of makers within a community. I am part of a long-standing collaboration with artist Linda Tien titled The Implement Archive Project. For the better part of the decade, we have investigated what is commonplace by exploring and altering familiar objects usually found within the home. Our collaboration is woven into each of our individual studio practices. Working within this creative partnership has allowed me to re-envision and reconsider what is personal practice. It's also augmented my idea of what is conceptual growth. My clarity of voice as an artist has emerged within the space that only time can allow. Time away from formal training within the academic sphere and time focused on my own personal practice. This has been paralleled with my time leading a community center of makers in a non-competitive learning environment. I believe that the future of ceramics is more complex than ever. It's my goal that we bring an interdisciplinary approach to creative development and to cultivate new approaches to ceramics, both traditional and non-traditional. I hope to spark conversation and actions within our greater community. It's my investigation within my work and my intentions within my studio practice alongside my community development that I believe will continue to help move this conversation forward within our community. Thank you very much. My work comes from different places. They are intertwined with my life's work, community service, projects, residencies, teaching, and people that I've worked with and even my family, especially my mom. Her stories were so vivid and fragmented and magical. She was an orphan when she was four years old. Her mother died during childbirth along with the new baby when my mom was little. She was five years old when she had her first pair of shoes. I made my first paintings on satin fabric when I was 13 years old. 
They were baby blankets my mother sold. She would say, mijita, paint a unicorn, paint an angel. And I painted with fabric paint, and I couldn't make a mistake. It had to be just right. By the time I was 14, I was drawing on pillowcases with blue ink. They were stolen from my locker in seventh grade. This is the first time that I realized that I could communicate through drawing. It really allowed me to imagine new kinds of imagery in my drawing. I studied ceramics with Annabeth Rosen and paintings with Wayne Thiebaud. They both had a profound impact on my life. Wayne Thiebaud's indelible lessons encouraged me to find my own way in painting, to see the physicality and the character of color. He spoke of spring green, clinical green, dark dewy green. While at Davis, my professor Annabeth Rosen was incredibly prolific. During her first year of teaching at Davis, we were allowed to see her studio, and I was so shocked. There was red clay everywhere, smashed clay from floor to ceiling. I had a physical reaction that I couldn't describe, that I could make something far beyond my intention, that interlocking systems of thought can trigger our senses. I wanted to be like her, to engage in the material of clay with a level of urgency, physicality, and intuition. Through that process, I can learn about myself and the world. The drawing on the surface of the clay was philosophical. It was human. I was hooked. The physicality of clay triggers different kinds of stories. They are connected to my childhood memories. I was born in Monterrey, Mexico. We immigrated to the United States when I was three years old, and we later became US citizens. Our first summer there in California, we picked cherries. By the time I was 13, I worked full time at a cannery sorting cherries from five in the morning to midnight, and then seven in the morning, I'd go back to junior high school. By the time I was 17, I dropped out of high school and I ran away from home. I moved to Sacramento, which is the ne next big city next to Lodi, and I enrolled myself back in high school. I signed my papers and I was back in. My high school teacher encouraged me to apply to art school, and I was accepted, but instead I took a job at University of California Davis Medical Center. I was doing an on-the-job training, uh, and we got, we got a chance to visit different facilities, the mall, fire, the fire department, so many places. And when I visited the hospital, I knew that's what I wanted to do. And uh, while a senior, I, I got hired. So I, I first was doing uh, transporting lab, and I thought it was so incredible because I got to see a code blue, and I really got to participate in patients' lives. But when I got hired, I was still in high school, and they hired me as a patient escort. So over the years, I worked my way up. I got a commercial driver's license to drive a bed vehicle, a gurney, and a wheelchair vehicle. And I mainly transported patients uh, to and from their hospital beds uh, to uh, non-emergency locations for treatment centers, burn patients, uh, burn centers, and all, all those kinds of things. As a driver, I worked with all different kinds of patients, from renal dialysis to cancer patients. There were so many different stories. Working with the children at the Shriners Hospital, the elderly and the critically ill affected me the most. The children I worked with were mature, they were experienced, they were wise. The older patients resembled children, they were vulnerable and afraid, but the children were brave. I was so careful when I carried a patient, a two-year-old boy, onto my gurney. I could see his veins and his skin was pale and translucent. His belly was enlarged. He reminded me of the ceramic water jugs I was making. Working from memory and clay, the small bodies appeared as little vessels or water jugs. They also reminded me of my first ceramic works, which resembled uh, hearts and lungs. I witnessed parents express great joy when their child laughed and experienced great sorrow when their child was in pain. The two extreme emotions were complicated and layered. I wanted to focus on a subtle gesture or a simple gaze and how different emotions can coexist in a single work to overlap ideas, time, and existence. It is the child's spirit in the adult that I search for and vice versa. The child side sculpture parallel adult characteristics and mannerisms. Their intimate scale reflect and occupy our space. Their small body frames are surrogates that embody psychological and sociological structures of human behavior. Within the frame of a small body appears a person at different stages of aging and development, from innocence, through puberty, through adolescent behavior, and through the process of aging. I try to grasp a deeper understanding of the human condition. 
Growing up in California, I straddled between speaking Spanish at home and assimilating into the American culture. When I was in second grade, I was playing in the playground and a kid shot me behind my leg with a BB gun. As a child, I developed an awareness of how I was seen as separate or the other. The childhood memory led me to look at American cartoon culture and I began researching kids with guns. I thought my research would elaborate on violence in countries torn by war. Instead, my image search led to the shooting range in America. I'm also connected to the people that I worked with. In their stories, I learned about political and social structures ranging from immigration, racial intolerance, and concepts stemming from fear to hate and violence. I am interested in ethics and its function to critique. It allows me to ask different kinds of questions between right and wrong. It leads me to think about political structures, human behavior, human nature, rooted in deeper personal observations of race, culture, identity, economic status, and language. The primal impulses of clay lends itself, and its immediacy allows me to engage in such topics. Revealing the elements of the building process is important to me. I leave traces of the marks with my fingerprints and my hands, often pinching and pulling the coils into portraits. The overarching themes in my work propel me to ask questions about my role. How will I contribute to and be active in my community? It has led me to different types of community service, from working with children in orphanages, young men and women in detention centers, women in domestic violence programs. I've created projects with underrepresented communities, teaching kids in art nonprofit organizations and after school programs. I've created all different types of projects from murals to painting to installation. These projects have allowed me to think about similarities and the idea of having a collective memory and to think about tolerance and inclusion. Thank you. I find my inspiration in the world around me. My phone is full of pictures of architecture, infrastructure, and humanity. All of my trucks are modeled off specific years and makes. My buildings are also scale models of specific buildings and places. When building them, I often think of my clay slabs like sheets of wood. I worked in construction myself on and off for 10 years while pursuing my education. I worked as a fuser on gas lines, as a carpenter, and for the longest time as co-owner and shop manager of a precast GFRC concrete shop. I am a first-generation student, and for a long time, and even now sometimes, I feel more comfortable in a shop than I do in academia. When making my buildings, I often feel like I am a giant on a construction site. I refer to my experiences in the trade when constructing a piece, and much of my research is spent learning how different building techniques are done. I investigate, say, how a flat roof is made, or maybe, say, how a row house is framed, so I can repeat the same steps and honor the people who did it on the original building. I have lived in the United States for almost nine years now, and in that time, I have lived in seven different states following the work just like my dad did when I was a kid. In each of those places, I have seen the same struggles caused by rising prices, low wages, and an ever-increasing wealth gap. Market forces, greed, and political whims force people to move across countries and borders. As Dolores Huerta reminded us in her powerful keynote on Wednesday, 10% of the American public has hoarded 80% of our wealth. I probably consume too much news and too many podcasts, and I definitely ask too many questions when I meet new people but I think a lot about people. I think a lot about their spaces, their homes. I think about their corner stores, community centers, and workplaces. I think about who controls those spaces. Landlords and slumlords, redlining and gentrification. I think about who made those spaces, the cribbers, gas fitters, and painters. I think about how all this stuff got there. The long haul truckers, the electrical grid, or the mail person. The people who feed us, keep our shelves stocked, and package our orders. Those people who we call essential workers, but don't treat them like the heroes we espouse them to be. I'm interested in this network of people who, when they come together, can literally move mountains and build skyscrapers. There is so much invisible labor that we don't appreciate until the water won't turn on in our showers or our furnaces won't light in a snowstorm. I see buildings and the spaces they occupy as vessels. They hold within them the residue of the lives that have passed through them, while their outsides are reflections of their time and place. 
Each brick was placed by someone's hand, the foundation poured by a crew, and the porch lights glow from the effort of an electrician. Once a structure is built, it becomes like a book with blank pages, ready to be marked and altered to hold its history. The front banister was bent when the second owner backed his car into it. Those marks on the doorframe track the growth of a child. The old shag carpet may look worn now, but in its day it was the grooviest pad on the block. The ornate molding around the front door is original to the home, covered now with eight layers of paint and somehow out of place in its rundown neighborhood. But this molding hints back to a time when the jobs were union and the hope was palpable. We can look to these vessels to learn the history of a neighborhood and its people. We can look at them and see the current state of an area, the economics, immigration, and social pressures. I understand the buildings in Edmonton, and I can probably interpret most in Alberta, but when I left Canada, I became an observer. The USA has a history that I know the basics of, but there is so much more regional history I am missing. As I move across the states, I use the buildings like signposts, which I try to interpret. I am an outsider looking in, trying to understand the social and economic constructs that I have landed in. In California, yellow lawns signal drought. Seemingly countless Mexican restaurants spoke of colonization and immigration, while astronomical rents signaled the tech boom, whose fingers of gentrification had begun to spread cubist concrete boxes across the bay. But there were still whiffs of its hippie past in the streetcars of San Francisco and the small ramshackle beach houses in Santa Cruz. Kansas was divided down political lines, Dems in the city, Republicans in the country. But Kansas was proud of its history, Old structures still carried the battle scars of the Civil War when they fought hard to be a free state. Philadelphia's roads were muddled with potholes and lined in my neighborhood with boarded up homes. Signs of a large city in poverty with a failing public service. A choice made by a few to focus on the wants of a small faction over the greater good. It is visually the most aggressive and influential city that I've lived in. As I would drive through my neighborhood, I imagined what life was like before the corner store was shuttered, back when there were no burned out homes and empty lots. In Philly's architecture, I read hope and resilience. In its people, I felt pride, kinship, and an attitude of DIY urbanism. Nothing can stop someone from Philly, not even Crisco on the light poles during the Super Bowl. From where I sat each night on the old worn marble stoop of my rented row house, I saw the signs of change. Those empty lots were beginning to fill with new homes for new families to make their own impressions, but I wondered at what cost. Although my work has a lot of melancholy in it and I can get quite serious about it, I also love to use a lot of humor in my work. As the great Mary Poppins once sang, a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down. The COVID pandemic has affected all of our lives. Shortly after it began, the world was also coming to terms with political upheaval and racial injustices. I found myself wanting to make angry work at the time, burning buildings and ruins, but I decided the world had enough anger without me adding to it, so I turned to humor and began to make my series of dumpster fires and trash candles. So each of those candles contains within their wax trash from the past few years. So here we can see we've got some horse brushes, a little nod to the ivermectin. We've got some scales, because if you're anything like me, you've drank a lot of beer and ate a lot of chocolate in the beginning. Kleenex for all of our tears. There's some TV remotes for all the uh, marathons we were doing. And they're not here, but actually the 2020 mail-in ballots that are still missing, apparently I found them and they're in those candles. So I got a couple of them if you need them. At a time like this in the world where we all seem so divided, I believe that clay can still bring us together. Whether it's for whiskey or for a meal, clay has the power to connect and the power to heal. Clay makes space for conversation and contemplation and has become home for so many of us. Seeing all of the kindness and smiles over the last few days has filled me with hope again and it's fortified me to go back home and keep up the work. And I wanna to say to my sweet orange boy, Oscar, I'll be home soon, buddy. Thank you. I was a super energetic girl since I was young. I had short hair mostly, and I really loved to play with a friend outside and watch a cartoon all the time. Especially, I love to go to an amusement park because I feel like I, I'm a kind of cartoon character. I want to be a princess when I was young, and I didn't have any specific dream. I was just studying to go to a good university. I never thought about becoming an artist in my life when I was young. 
especially I didn't know doodling can be an art. Illustrative drawing, installation, public art, and using technology are three main subjects of my art practice. So I will talk about how I make work about different way of communication beyond the language. My family moved around a lot since childhood because of my dad's business. It was always hard to say goodbye to all my friends. But my dad always bought a series of Disney cartoon books, Korean folktale books, and all kinds of books when I was little. So I need all the books that I could get my hands on since I was young. So cartoon was my best, best friend all the time. Especially I love Toy Story and Alice in Wonderland because I could imagine the sense of the passage of time, the space of the whole story, and feeling of sound and action. Minhwa is Korean folktale painting. Minhwa is one of my biggest inspiration because of variety of vivid color, sense of humor with nature and animals, and conventional layout. For this work, the first time I tried to make my own version of cartoon story based on a family vacation and Korean tragedy by using Amaco Black Underglaze to create line drawing on a sculpture surface. I started to use a lot of color. I got an inspiration from Paper Doll. It's a really analog toy, but always one of my favorite. I'm thinking about pure passion and for uh, for playing and innocent happiness through this work. Childhood memory and experience have developed aspect of who I am now. When I was little, I was able to adapt to my surrounding as play area can be anywhere. Also living in different city and country during childhood has taught me social, independent, survival, creative, and imaginative skill. I was so happy when I was working on this piece. I hope you guys are feeling happy now through my work. When I was in grad school, I did a lot of insulation work. I tried to find out what is meaning of home and homeland between belonging and displacement. This work explored the idea of connection, also the reality of existing in place and space. I can put my whole entire life and journey into my two luggage and I'm really interested in the between of permanent and temporary space to represent home. This was my first public art piece. These spaces are created as a way to protect myself from obstacle and represent the boundary between interior and exterior space. For this work, I use a digital tool such as a laser cutter on a ceramic surface to create a line drawing for the first time. I think I was so lucky to work in Fab Lab as a lab technician during the MFA program. I think using technology is a rethinking of historical whole processing and a new way of framing and perspective. Experiencing between the East and the West, I learned a lot about myself by seeing myself through other eyes. Also, I realized I couldn't understand who I am without the people around me to fully express myself. This work describes distance and to capture my experience, memory, and story between the East and the West. Also, moving and packing are connected to my personal narrative and experience of immigration. I use clay as well as hand building technique to blending traditional ceramic process with contemporary idea to share my experience, memory, dreams, and emotion. Thank you. Thank you so much. So my practice involves pushing materials to their limit and beyond, soliciting and confronting breakage and breakdown, and engaging in processes of reimagining and reformation. I prioritize public art and collaborative memory work with communities impacted by racial violence. By confronting painful histories, we can work to reform and remember what has been willfully broken or inadvertently left aside. In 2019 and 2020, I facilitated several large-scale mosaic sculpture projects created in community with hundreds of other people who gathered to honor Los de Boulder, 
six Chicanx student activists who were killed amid their struggle for equity in education at CU Boulder in 1974. These students and activists died during a weeks-long occupation of temporary Building 1 on CU Boulder's campus, in which students demanded continued funding and growth for the educational opportunity programs which brought Mexican-American students and other marginalized students to campus beginning in 1968. On May 27, 1974, Yuna Jacola, Reyes Martinez, and Neva Romero were killed by a car bomb at Chautauqua Park in Boulder. On May 29th, Francisco Doherty, Heriberto Terran, and Florencio Granado were killed by a second car bomb in a parking lot near 28th and Canyon. Antonio Alcantar was severely injured in that second explosion. The circumstances surrounding their deaths were never adequately investigated at any level of law enforcement, and the cases were never solved. The first sculpture from this project, titled Los Seis de Boulder, was acquired by the university libraries at CU Boulder. And now it is permanently installed on that campus after two years of advocacy by students, alumni, and campus and community leaders against the university administration. The second sculpture, titled El Movimiento Sigue, The Movement Continues, was created in cooperation with the city of Boulder and will be installed at the corner of 28th and Canyon. It's currently on view at the Boulder Museum of Contemporary Art. A mosaic panel titled Santos at the center of this slide is installed at the William Wise Law Library at CU Boulder and is named for Santos Rodriguez, the Chicano boy who was murdered by Dallas police in 1973 and was the subject of student protest and advocacy at CU Boulder. Finally, a pair of mosaic panels pictured here behind me and one of my collaborators, Carlos Sandoval, is titled Symbols of Resistance and is installed at the School of Education at CU Boulder. It celebrates Ricardo Falcón, Lucille Buchanan, Lupita Montoya, and Tinea Winder, along with hundreds of others, for their work in making CU Boulder a better place for black students, indigenous students, and students of color. I continue learning about and recognizing the people who fought and fight for racial equity in education. In 2021, I worked on another mosaic project with my students at Coker University to commemorate the stories of activists and advocates in South Carolina. Our work referenced incredible courage and incredible tragedies, among them the Orangeburg Massacre, in which law enforcement opened fire on a group of black students from South Carolina State University who were peacefully protesting segregation in 1968. Samuel Hammond Jr., Henry Smith, and Delano Middleton were killed and dozens more injured. The mosaics are now displayed at the Cecil Williams South Carolina Civil Rights Museum in Orangeburg, and I'm now planning similar work that celebrates student activism and also inventories and interrogates existing public space and visual culture at Scripps College in California, where I now teach. So the classroom is another essential site for shifting the assumptions and frameworks of educational institutions and expanding the possibilities of artistic practice for my students and for myself. I teach about public art and the politics of representation, decolonial and anti-racist art practice, and queer and feminist methods of cultural production. I invite students to use clay and other materials for self-expression and communication on their own terms, which is crucial to empowerment and survival. After the loss of my friend Roman Anaya, who I met in graduate school, I became more deliberate about making the classroom as safe and affirming as possible for my students. Roman was a fabulous, caring, and feeling artist who died in an exceedingly stressful and neglectful campus environment. As a young, effeminate boy, I was maliciously called Ninita, little girl, and Maricon, a homophobic slur. This is addressed in my work by proudly referring to myself in images as Marie Con Amor, a play on words from being called Marie Con throughout my life. 
Roman's work refigured insult and pain into strength and beauty. Roman was a first-generation college student. Roman was Mexican-American. Roman traced their ancestry to the Tarahumara tribe. Roman was queer. Roman had epilepsy. We must all teach, support, and mentor in ways that show trust in the knowledge and brilliance of students whose existence in educational spaces is routinely challenged. As a mixed race person, I have felt uncomfortable, furious, and gaslit by many of the ideas and norms of our field. Having given up on changing ceramics, I've deepened and developed my understanding of what it can mean to be an artist who works with clay, and I continue to articulate my practice within and against the discipline. Ceramics is about material, extraction, mixture, iteration, transformation, fragmentation, precarity, and reforming. The liberatory power of clay, such as it is, lies not in any of its vitrified conclusions, but in our varied encounters with the material and the standing potential to begin again. Thank you. So I was born and raised in Bangkok, Thailand. I had never seen a flake of snow. I, I never spent more time abroad more than two weeks in a row. And in 2019, I earned an MFA degree from Edinburgh University in Pennsylvania, just in half an hour from Lake Erie. So the winter situation there was rough. I think I met my snow quota for my entire life. <laughs> and I got my BA in ceramic design from Chulalongkorn University, where I now teach. My family, my ceramic, my Q-pop, and myself on FaceTime because it was what we was it was a thing when I was in school. I'm showing you guys my student visa because my time living abroad was when I learned the most about everything in my entire life. It has been three years since I graduated, but every time that I take a good look at it, it still reminds me of who I was then and who I now become. Another thing about most visa that is not permanent is almost like not real life. So that's why I wanna talk about my experience and how I have been through my time there and really affect my artwork. I don't want to art about my feelings. <laughs> I don't know who made this print, but it was hanging outside of my studio in Edinburgh. Before this, with my design background and how Thailand is kind of limited to art scene, I didn't care enough to think about feelings in art. Then I came here and I have seen more art. I have met a lot of artists, and most of them make work about their feelings. So I came to a conclusion that everybody is doing the same thing, just in different way. After a while, I lost my interest toward that. I thought to myself that I don't want to make art that reflects the society, but I want to make art about the society that I want to be in and how can we make it better. And then I spent quite some time to look within myself. In 2016, I moved from Thailand to the state to pursue my master's degree, and I was unavoidably immersed in an entirely new culture. I was trying so hard to fit in. I want to talk like them. I want to walk like them. I want to dress like them. So in my first year, I was running around in the studio asking people what is the first land that pop up in their mind. You can think of one. Um, so we wrote it down and put this chart on my studio wall so I can see it and I can like keep memorizing it every day. Something that I couldn't, that I didn't get to learn in Thailand. I'm not gonna go through them. <laughs> I don't think I should, but you could. And yes, they are really important. <laughs> I'm being serious, yeah. Um, to live in a college, uh, in a small college town with, with less than 5% Asian population enhanced those feelings. On one heavy snow day, I was walking to the studio with bundle in coat and scarf with nothing showing except my eyes, I noticed a middle-aged white guy. He was staring at me, and all of a sudden, I just ran into the bathroom and looked into the mirror, wondering if a person can tell if I'm Asian based on these two gaps between my scarf and my beanie. I was trying really hard to blend in, and no matter how hard I try, it's still gonna be me with this face, so I feel like that insecurity not gonna do good for anybody, especially me. It's like 
no matter where I go, no matter how much I try to act like Americans or people here, I still gonna look like that polar bear. Even if the beak, I still not a penguin. Since then, the more time I spent observing others, I saw more and more people from around the world who share similar feelings. I realized that you don't need to fit in to be happy. Be unique. <laughs> don't look at that screen. <laughs> be unique and be grateful that you are you. I came across the story of a man who went to jail and when he came back, I mean, I think he probably served like how many years in, in jail and he came back and he feel like he don't know this world anymore. He saw a lot of people like um, with like the big phone and like tiny devices on his the ear and nobody was reading newspaper in uh, subway anymore. He feel out of place. He feel like he has a lot to keep up. So I feel that uh, from that story, it got me thinking, what if dinosaur came back to life? <laughs> okay. What if dinosaur came back to life in this present world? How would they feel? They were here first and they died long time ago and we slowly taking up their world, changing it. And when they're back, they would probably struggle to fit in and strive to live the life that suits this modern world. So my work is all about dinosaur. As a representative of myself and people that are fitting in, or maybe just over it, and just trying to live their unique life. Doing something normal like walking their baby, or just skateboarding, grocery shopping, or just chilling with his favorite yo-yo, trying to act normal after a fart. Um, <laughs> I also put my dinosaur on my pottery because I always see my pottery. As a miniature of my sculpture, I use all of the elements, like the handles are from the sculpture tail and decorative parts. I like take photo of cups all together because when you look at it, you squint your eyes a little. It kind of like does look like a sculpture. Most people, especially my mom, always have a comment that my, my, my mugs are not like functional enough, but I always say that I view, view them as the same as high heels. Um, <laughs> definitely uncomfortable comparing to sneakers, but they are fun to wear and kind of make you special for a moment. <laughs> my illustration on clay is kind of started from when I was first start making pottery because I was Finding the way to put my sculpture on my pottery, then I found myself really like drawing on ceramic because I can control both form and decoration. So basically, I draw ordinary daily scenes of humans but represent them as dinosaurs. People usually ask where I get the idea for my illustration. I unconsciously draw things that I've seen on shows like dinosaurs surviving a group of zombies or cliche dino prom party. In this series is inspired by Riverdale, which is really similar to my life back in grad school. Small college town, rural scene, crazy thing happened and everybody know what's up except people on the outside. My two and three dimensional brains always bouncing back and forth. I learned to integrate ceramic and illustration, pottery and sculpture, one culture to one another, finding way to make them complement each other. Although sometimes people ask me if I consider myself a potter or a sculptor, it always got me paused for a second, thinking why I have to be just one, why you have to pick which one, while I can be anything or nothing at all. So in this particular piece, I make a figure holding a mug just to challenge those who like to categorize things. I painted Trois de Jouy, which is a beautiful French pattern commonly used for decorative goods like furniture and stuff, but not really for costume back in the day. Just to question whether is this an art piece or just another furniture in someone's house. 
The use of different color in my work is a way for me to demonstrate everyone's differences. Each person as well as each color is unique. To further illustrate this point, I have developed a special technique for creating and casting color effects on my work by layering plexiglass. Combining color on top of colors allows me to tell a story of cross-cultural experiences in dual or multicultural backgrounds. Each combination is entirely unique. We are the color the fruit of our own experience. Before I went to grad school, my future in clay seemed cloudy. Looking back, I wouldn't, I wouldn't even dare imagine pursuing Korean in clay. I was raised and now live in Bangkok, Thailand. Ceramic has deep roots in our history and lifestyle, which I am really grateful, but also tremendously terrified because with cheap labor over there and numerous ceramics factories, most Thai perceive the concept of clay as being nothing more than a bowl you can find at a parking shop. It's like less than 50 cents. So most of the time, they devalue handmade and view clay as cheap material. Ceramics is on the verge of not being considered an art form. This feels like an obstacle, but it also means that there's still plenty of room to grow. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you.